first person to present today is Carrie Higby of Seaman Corporation. Can we give her a big hand? Good morning, or afternoon. Good, good. Afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Carrie Higby, and I'm the Global Director of Data Center Solutions and Services at the Seaman Company. And uh, I literally have Earth. So a lot of what you're going to hear about is what we see in data center markets all over the globe. Most of my work is with end users, colos, hosted type facilities. Uh, I also sit on a lot of the different standards committees. I sit on a lot of different bodies that have other things to do with the data center. And then I also write for a bunch of different technical publications. So if you ever need a great cure for insomnia, you can Google my name and it should fix you right up. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit today about some different designs and different things that are changing in the data center. Uh, this is some of the organizations that I participate with, so you can see it's quite a few of them. I actually sleep on Thursday nights, so you're probably in trouble. Uh, but you can see it is a lot, and it is internationally global in reach. Uh, just so you know a little bit about us, we are a cabling connectivity manufacturer, copper fiber, racks, cages, cabinets, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but as a green manufacturer, we really, this is something we take pride in. Uh, we started our green initiatives uh, before the 1960s when the only thing really cool and green was Kermit the Frog. We have 3,300 acres of conserved forest land. We just outfitted our main uh, global manufacturing facility in Connecticut with a 220 kilowatt solar power plant. All of our manufacturing, regardless of what country it is in, is ISO 14001 certified, which is a very sick, strict, sick, strict set of environmental guidelines. And we also have a zero landfill policy. We recycle 99% of everything, uh, or over 99% of all materials in the house. We have a very little bit that leaves, and that turns into something that goes into asphalt. So all of this together, we are 330% carbon negative, which is a very great number, something very hard for other people to achieve. But when we talk about being green, it's not just something we preach. It's something we actually practice. Hmm. You disconnect my remote there. Maybe. Uh, it's not working. It's not working. Oh, okay. The middle button isn't a button. The middle button's a dot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there we go. Oops. Got it? So, okay. when you talk about being green, the big thing we talk about is power. From the day you open the data center's doors till the day you close it, 50% of your total cost of ownership is your power bill. So whether you care because you really care about the environment or you care just because it is your bottom line, it is a big number. When I was running large data centers, power was a line item under my budget. It's something that we watched very closely because it is a big expense. So if you think about all the power that's consumed by data centers, there's a couple things that really help you out as an end user. There's a European Union initiative that started a few years back to lower all the power consumption in the European Union data centers. Um, and then we also have one that was our Federal Executive Order 13423 to lower power consumption in our government data centers 3% year over year through 2015 for a 30% drop in power. Now what that means to you as an end user is that this is a big number. And in every country, everywhere in the world, the number one purchaser of technology is our governments because they have our tax dollars to play with. And if that ain't enough, they just raise our happy taxes, right? So, if you're a Dell, an IBM, an HP, whoever you are, and your number one customer comes to you and says, look, we're not going to buy your stuff unless it's if you make it a little more green, it starts becoming a big priority. The advantage to everybody else as an end user is they don't just sell that technology to the government. But if we want to chase down that power bill in a data center, 50% of that power bill on average is cooling. Now, there's lots of different cooling methods. Uh, free air cooling, which is not really, but you know, outside air technology, air economizers, water economizers, different things that drop that bill. But then if we look at networking equipment and go after the next chunk and the next biggest segment, it's our servers. It's about 29% of that power bill, and then about 5% is networking. Obviously, that doesn't add up to 100%. It's not a blonde moment. The rest is lighting and other things that go into the facility. <clears throat> but these are our biggest ones that we chase. Uh, now, the EPA came out with <clears throat> the Energy Star program. One of the things that came out of that was power usage effectiveness. One thing that you will note is that we are now not using just PUE, it is PUE version 2, because the problem with PUE is that there's really no way to measure it in a lot of data centers. If you look at a lot of data centers, they're sitting in a corporate office building and they come on the same power bill as the entire corporate office building. 
So, people were using kilowatts, they were using PDU output, they were using different numbers. PUE version 2 now requires that we actually look at kilowatt hour supply to get to those numbers. There's four levels under PUE 2. We have 0, 1, 2, and 3, which is the four levels. And each one of those depend on exactly what we're measuring. But that has changed. And then you look at things like the green grid. We now have carbon usage effectiveness, water usage effectiveness, um, data center infrastructure effectiveness. So all of these things are changing. There are different metrics to measure this. Because you can't fix what you can't measure, right? You've got to know what, you got to have a starting place. So that has changed a little bit. Now, as far as the green grid, they do, there's a lot of great work going on there. They have uh, some amazing white papers and information out there to help you look at the other thing, the cooling part, which I'm not going to cover much because we already have cooling speakers today. But one of the big things you'll see is this carbon usage effectiveness. There's a lot of talk about carbon tax and how that is. The tricky part is, you know, who really polices that number? It's going to be a bit difficult. So I think we're going to see some more strict reporting and metrics, uh, particularly coming out of the European Union, but a lot of that also is going to trickle back to the U.S. Uh, now, a few things that are changing as far as compute efficiency and things that we're working on in IEEE, energy efficient Ethernet is one. And that's a really cool thing because we know that Ethernet is a very bursty traffic, right? It doesn't broadcast all the time. It's like a little kid. You feed a lot of sugar, it runs around like crazy, and then it passes out. So basically what we're doing with energy efficient ethernet is you are in full power mode when you're broadcasting on the network. When you're not, we put that port to sleep. We feed it a magic packet. I know that sounds Alice in Wonderland, but that's really what it's called, to wake it back up to broadcast. So between your full power mode and your sleep mode, your net average power goes down significantly. That is available on some technologies and not all technologies, but certainly something that's gonna help drive down some of the power for higher speed applications as we move forward. Now we know that speed is increasing. Virtualization is driving a lot of this. If I put eight servers on one physical platform, it better have a really good network connection. If you think a lot of the triple play, the quad play, different things that are going on, cloud services, we want to make sure that we have the bandwidth to support those. So according to Infinetics, by the end of this calendar year, 10, 40, and 100 gigs should be a $20 billion industry internationally. A lot of money there. <clears throat> and we're doing that because we do have the need for speed. We're all used to that instant access. You know, you go out, you look at those crackberries, right? We all want our email right then. You go do a Google search, you click on a link, it's slow. Who sits and waits on the link? Nobody. You hit the backspace, you go to the next link, and you figure out who's fastest. So we know that that speed is, is there. And the things that are driving that are listed here. Virtualization, consolidation. You know, people have figured out, we went from a very, you know, one data center that supports a whole, in, you know, company, to then we decided we need to scatter them all over the place and now we've realized with virtualization we do better to bring back and consolidate them down to our site and our DR site or multiple DR sites. And then we also have things like Blade Technologies where the switch is inside the chassis so it has to have basically uplink speed ports. Now the biggest problem that you see in most data centers today is this right here. We have different departments that all have different budgets. You have facilities, networking, servers, applications, storage in some cases, security. And the problem is, you know, I, I go to a lot of meetings with Global 500 customers and, and really large end users, and you have to introduce these guys to each other because they don't talk. And the problem that you have is if any one of these guys makes a bad decision, it has horrible effects on the other guy. The Uptime Institute put a, had a study out there where this one company bought $38 million in blade centers, and they had to do a $78 million facilities upgrade to run an unbudgeted expense. Never, never good. So, the idea is to try to get all of these departments working and look at the cause and effect for the different ones. And I'll kind of walk you through a scenario that talks about this. Now, TI 942 has been our data center standard here in the U.S. for a long time. We are changing that now. It is in the process of being TI 942A, and it should publish hopefully first quarter of next year. And there's also an international equivalent, which is ISO 24764. In both of these standards, you'll notice that it says that all of your horizontal and vertical cabling shall be run accommodating growth so you don't have to revisit those areas. That way our pathways and spaces are properly defined. We don't have to worry about, you know, we've all seen the pictures of the growth stuff, right? When you have the cable plant that looks like spaghetti under the floor and everybody says, oh yeah, you're going to have air dams. The truth is a properly designed pathway in space has never had an adverse effect on air under the floor, air overhead, or safety overhead. It's when people don't have change management and they let it run amok that it gets to be a bad thing. 
Category 6A is the minimum twisted pair cabling in both standards. ISO also recognizes Category 7 and 7A because that's an ISO standard. And OM3 currently is the minimum grade of fiber. In 942A, OM4 is expected to be the minimum grade of fiber. And you see this. You hear this term top of rack, middle of row, end of row, and you'll find that that does not exist in the standards. It says that everything shall be connected via a structured cabling system unless some specific application requires something else. But we have some guys that are out there pushing top of rack solutions. Now, some other things, when you talk about the different categories of cable, the reason that we talk about 6A, 7, and 7A is that built into 10G base T, which is expected to be the average horizontal speed within the next couple years in a data center, we have what's called short reach mode. You don't have to launch as strong a signal to go under 30 meters as you do to go over 30 meters. So when we look at these short reach modes, we can throttle down the power, and it saves us, according to Intel, about a watt and a half per port. If I save one watt at my server, that translates into 2.84 watts throughout my entire facility with PDU loss, cooling, all that kind of stuff. So you think about that, it's about a three to one ratio. So if I can increase my speed and lower my power, it's a good thing. And 10 g base t has finally got to the point where it's low enough power that we are in you know, that realm that we can start deploying that technology. <clears throat> So 942A is going to include all of the addendums that already exist out there, 6A as the minimum being one of those. But we also have a slightly expanded topology, and this is really done mostly for colos and different hosted environments where we need intermediate distribution areas to be able to distribute out to the horizontal distribution areas. What you'll notice here, this is how we build in our redundancy. So we have all of our intermediate distribution areas, our horizontal distribution areas, and we build out the redundancy we need. And I say need with, with a big, big exclamation point. If you think about virtualization now, we have one server that's mirrored to another server. And if both of those servers come in with dual network cards and dual power supplies, every application is now backed up with four network ports and four power supplies. So we need to pay attention to how redundant we really are, because in a lot of cases, we're too redundant and we repeat ourselves. <coughs> so if we look at this from a colo perspective, um, this is one of the colos I'm working with over in Asia. But you can see how we build this out. So we've got our main distribution areas that are fed off our maybe rooms. Those go up to our intermediate distribution areas on each floor, which feeds out to the horizontal distribution areas, which feed out to our different end users. The same thing would happen in a large enterprise. You might have different horizontal distribution areas, you know, one for finance, one for personnel, depending on your needs. But it does get a little trickier. Um, and that's based on a tier four type facility. I think one of the things we're going to see is outside of the colo market, we're going to quit hearing about tier levels. We certainly have, you know,